say goodbye. So I think by the time this comes out on the Blu-ray, it'll be close to 10 years since this movie came out. Wow. You were the first person, I think, on the project with me. I think I was. I remember being holed up writing for almost a year, developing it, and coming up with the title, Finding Nemo. And I remember being in that same office and coming up with the image of an egg left in the sand. It didn't have connections to its relationship now, but I remember having those. I remember talking also a lot about when you're snorkeling, coming to the edge of the reef and then looking at that expanse of blue that goes down and just how you feel. Yeah, the idea yeah. of like the void. I kept it calling it the void. There, yeah. void yeah. It's like, how do you visualize something that isn't there? Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like. Go, Ralph. <laughs> there we go, That's, there's, your, there's your job. But I remember it's like, I felt it was the perfect metaphor for life. It's like infinite possibilities and, and you have every reason to be afraid of it. So friends of mine, I did not know. They always skipped the first chapter. Whenever, oh, they, oh, whenever yeah. they show, and then there's one Thanksgiving. We're all hanging out, and Kimber's going, going, "We got to, oh, we got to, you know, <laughs> somebody keep the kids busy." So uh, I went over and they said, oh, "We want to see Nemo." So I see where this I is going. Threw, <laughs> I threw the disc oh, in and hit play, <laughs> and then you know she comes running. No, don't play the first. Don't play the first. The, last the kids time are Graham just like, got scarred them. Yeah. <laughs> no. That is a pretty tough scene, though. Terms of the intensity? Yeah. yeah. You know, I never, ever, ever, ever doubted it. Unless you're remembering something I don't. Well, I don't remember. I mean, ever we, I mean I, we might have adjusted we the, the, the way we did it, but just the scene itself, I yeah. never doubted it. I don't know. As a writer, I took it as a challenge. Like, look, at, we all worry about our kid crossing the street and possibly getting hit. We all worry with them being out of our sight the minute they turn the corner and we don't see them. And we all know nature is a predatory world, and that pretty much 24-7, something's out there trying to hunt, mm -hmm. trying to get. And so I loved the challenge of like, can you work within the real r rules of nature? Because it's much more truthful, and Bambi did it. And the minute I put it in that space, it's much more interesting to go, how do you deal with that if that is the truth? And you're the person trying to yeah. still raise a kid. So that was really well, was I, the whole point of the movie. Yeah. I knew we could. I knew there were so many other flavors of what a Pixar film could be. Yeah. And that this was, and I was pretty sure this could be one of them. And yeah. that if, if we were lucky, it would uh, give license to do that even more. We were pretty know? cognizant of that. I mean, we talked yeah. about it a lot, that we were kind of owning that yeah. and the, the sort of emotional tone of this film. Which is, again, so interesting because that was the first time I remember a lot of naysayers publicly saying this is going to be Pixar's first flop. I mean, yeah, how, it doesn't look like it's any People good. don't remember that, but there was a lot of that. The other problem on that movie, if we can talk about it, is just that, you know, Nemo wasn't the, the kind of the big sexy film no. at the time being made. No. The Incredibles. Brad was making The Incredibles, and, yeah. and it, everyone just knew that that was going to be an amazing looking movie, and everyone was excited about it. And people weren't quite so sure about Nemo. Ten years ago, we didn't know. What, or actually, it was 14 years ago, right, when we yeah, started or yeah. something. That, that we didn't know if we could even sell it to our to ourselves. Right, right. Internally, let alone could yeah. we do it. And I remember thinking then that this was a perfect medium to execute underwater. But I knew nothing about fish. The reason I came up with clownfish was because we were getting all these catalogs because we had little kids in our house that used to start getting all this crap kind of stuff. <laughs> and uh, And there was always this orange fish with two white stripes as one of the icons that tended to be in towels and on wallpaper. And I'm like, wow, this is used a lot. And it made me want to know what kind of fish that was. Got a coffee table book, opened it up, and there's these two fish sticking out of an anemone. And it already looked like a parent child. And I found out they were called clownfish. And it was just kind of from then on, it was like, done. So that's the beginning of the idea. Now we had to do a lot of research. <laughs> and one of the things we had to do as a group uh, was take scuba lessons. <laughs> Who went to the Monterey here. trip? Did you, you? No. I was already certified on that. You that, backed out of that? Yeah, so it was just the two of us? Yeah, we did our classroom here at Pixar. <laughs> and we were like so excited we're going to go in March. 
to Monterey. <laughs> we wore these five mil suits in which you gain in warmth, you lose in mobility. <laughs> so we're like the Michelin men underwater. I remember looking out there and thinking they were all professionals. And then we go out, you know, like awkward Darth Vader's like, <sighs> you know, getting out in there and realizing, oh, these are all people trying to learn and they're all trying not to drown and they're all, <laughs> and they're all trying not to, and I'm trying not to let them grab me and pull me down. It was like the worst scenario. It was so awful. And what was great, of course, is when we went to Hawaii, you jump in, it's like a giant swimming pool. So Hawaii was wasn't there the a trip where you got sick? So before most people showed up, you were diving in Maui, the backside of Molokini, mm -hmm. which is a, sh a sheer drop off. And on the boat, I'd taken my sea sickness pills, which I hadn't taken quite early enough in the morning. And we went down for our dive, and you go off a ledge just to the abyss. Got back on the boat, I'm blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Mid-sentence. You did it so kept casually kept that I was like, did I just see what I thought I saw? <laughs> you always eat bananas and drink fruit juice on a dive boat because they taste the same going in as they do coming out. Oh. At which point, everybody right. fruit this juice. This interview's and over. And right. This interview's over. Good tip. Right. And I didn't get to dive with you guys. But at the end, you know, we went to Australia to do press, and we didn't want to say that we had never yeah, gone right. diving on the Great Barrier Reef. Right. So I got certified Peace on the all. Great Barrier yeah. Reef, which was pretty awesome. When we got to Sydney Harbor to go to our hotel, and there were all these seagulls everywhere, <laughs> and they're all going, you know, mine, 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 and we're like, that's them. It's like meeting like the star of the movie. We're like, that's them. Here they are. It's just it's even the look of Sydney Harbor at night. I had that feeling that you get when you get to visit a movie set. And originally, the seagull flight took place through the city, which we could have done, but when you're in the middle of something, you don't get a good view of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I went on a tour around Sydney Harbor, and I was suggesting maybe we set it across the bay. You look across the bay, and you have what most people know of Sydney. Needle, bridge, opera house. Mm -hmm. If you didn't have those three things, you wouldn't know where you were. Right. The first research trip I got to do, this is when, you know, if you're on Rat Tattoo, you get to go eat in, you know, three-star restaurants in Paris and all that stuff. <laughs> Our first trip was to the sewage treatment plant. <laughs> they showed us how the whole thing worked. And then Andrew goes, OK, I've got a question for you. If a little clownfish came in right here. <laughs> Basically, no, it would never make it. No. It's funny that you did that whole research trip to the sewage treatment plant. Then we cut it out. Well, when I, when, you had, when I came onto the movie, one of the very first things that I did was suggest that you cut that whole sequence out. How much did I fight you? I, I remember. <laughs> long pause. I know, that, but that, 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 I, I, th I think there was a long pause at the lunch, and then you, you finally, you, you agreed at that lunch that it probably. Well, could some come of the out. same components of that going through that system ended up in the escape sequence through the tank and the filter system. So oh, that's you got, right. You got we a little bit of that little back little of that. in there. Yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting. I mean, it's just interesting. It happens yeah. on every film that we make. You have sequences that you just think are absolutely necessary, yeah. mm -hmm. and it's sometimes not till you get the whole thing up and even a lot of it animated and you really see what you have that you come to realize that something's just not needed. Right? I mean, I know myself enough now that I probably go overboard with that stuff on the third act because what you don't have the objectivity to see is what you can afford to lose. When you get to a certain point, fresh horses always seems to be helpful. I mean, you came in a little bit later, I came in a little later. A lot of our successful films have been when you have someone coming come in, in fresh. later who haven't been on it, who are, nothing's precious to, yeah. you know, the, and yeah. they're... Because one of the first things I did when you had me come on in the movie was I went back and watched every version of the movie. But the one thing, the only thing I remember specifically that you had taken out that I argued to put back in was having Nemo actually say, I hate you. I hate you because that had been jettisoned along mm. the way. I mean, if you remember, we, when you guys came on, I, I had hit a wall. It was a, it was a tough fall for me. I had, just couldn't figure out what was wrong with the movie. And I was getting to this dangerous place where I was questioning, you know, fundamentals of the movie. But at the same time, I don't think we had a morale problem internally because we were so excited about it. And we did have a good time. Absolutely. And, and, and that, that really seeped into the film, you know? I mean, one of the special moments for me in the film was just a night where we stayed late and we needed to figure out how does Marlin out in the ocean communicate to a kid in a fish tank? And just guerrilla filmmaking, we wrote it, we stood up, we recorded it, thought of characters on the fly. Hey, Bob, that whole lobster thing. and the the dolphins going, you know, mm -hmm. these two little fish have been, you know, yeah. and just crafted that, and it was a blast. It was essentially one night I, I, I staying mean, late. A, another similar thing that I remember, we were in art review one day, you were talking about the crabs, and he started, and then there's these seagulls that have, and they go, mine, 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 and the stop the art review, 
You reached in your pocket and you wrote something down. I'm thinking it must have been that. And then you put it back in. And you ran down. You were so excited. You ran into the room. I got it for the seagulls. It's like, I was up in art. It's like, you know how seagulls, they're on the beach. They're very selfish and they still, what if they just said, mine, mine, you know, and it came down from art review. And I, but I remembered um, Jason doing that. On like a paper towel. And we pretty much took exactly that. That's the seagull. Mine. One of the things I remember, the jellyfish scene was coming along, but something about it for you wasn't working. It, it felt perfectly perfect. Mm -hmm. I, I just remember reaching over and going, click, click. So suddenly, we were in the middle of a scene. It was zoomed in. And you were only seeing parts of the characters. Yes. And you said, that's it. That's, that's it. what I want. We shouldn't be able to follow them perfectly. Right, we should be yeah. always trying yeah. to find them. Boing, boing, <gasps> boing, Dory. boing, boing. You can't Dory. catch me. Jellyfish, got it. I'll remember to tell him. Hey, hey, wait You want to talk about working with Ellen DeGeneres? And I spilled my lunch on her shoes when I first met her. I walked up and knocked my lunch on her shoes and, and then started to try to wipe her shoes off. She's like, Bob, step away from the shoes. So I backed up. <laughs> and she was amazing because she's just so nice. I mean, she remembers everybody's name from the lowest to the highest and just Remember, oh, you, you lost the, to. the family battle over the two kittens. Oh, yep. Six That's months it. later or whatever. So how the kittens work out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My favorite line of hers in the movie that we cut out was in the scene where Marlon and Dory are slowly approaching the anglerfish. Grandma? Is that you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it made me laugh. <laughs> It yeah. made me laugh Funny so hard, goes. but it was kind of weird. Yeah. And remember, we, we were debating we whether we should use it or not. It for a while because it kept cracking us up, but it didn't crack other people up. Yeah. And I remember just feeling a little part of me died when well, I took yeah. it out. Yeah. I remember you <laughs> stepping on an Albert joke. Oh. In a session? Yes. And you could never get Albert never to, to redo a, a, a something twice. <laughs> Albert would give you just reams of great stuff, and then you'd find yourself never getting the line that was written on the paper. <laughs> so he gets up in front of what looks like the mic to, to do a joke. Oh, Oh, well, I actually do know one. <laughs> he goes, there's these two mollusks, and they're walking. Oh, he didn't walk, and he like, <laughs> sort of stopped himself. That, and you burst out laughing. Oh, oh. <laughs> and, and we never did it again. There was a, 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 a sea mollusk, and he, and he didn't walk. Why do I keep <laughs> thinking that? <laughs> Yeah, well, you stole a stapler in fourth grade, so I guess <laughs> I heard about that one. Well, he was great because he, he kept trying to get this reaction out of him. Obviously, we'd laugh a lot. He'd go on to the next line, and they'd go, oh, I know how to do it. And he'd go back three lines before and do it again. You know? I remember, I remember oh, Albert leaving at the end of sessions. He would head out to his car, and we'd start talking. And a moment later, the door would open. He'd say, I was thinking about that line. And he came right back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. to see that the coast is clear. We go out. And back in. And then we go out. Yes, yeah, so let's talk about Nemo poking his head out of the anemone for a minute, because those okay, shots were yeah. a special joy <laughs> for all of us to play with. Is that what you would consider the biggest burden on the film? When we started working on the anemone for a while, we had spent, I don't know, a year, a year and a half on research on getting surgeons told to move right. And then somebody said, hey, on monsters that are doing fur, so why don't we take a tennis ball, stick a bunch of foot long fur on it, and turn gravity upside down? We're like, oh. And we had an anemone the next day for review. You're like, wow, there's an anemone. Great. <laughs> yeah, so so we were grinding to a stop, and then out of left field came a solution from a different film. Best bit of trivia, though, did anybody know the, how we did the uh, Sandy Bottom? So you didn't actually film somebody's Sandy Bottom. <laughs> that's what I always <laughs> thought that's what it was. Upside down ocean surface. That Sandy Bottom oh, is, a frozen, kidding, really? is a frozen ocean surface. I had no really? idea. Really? That is really cool. Yeah. I just want to toss one thought in um, about Steve Jobs for a second. You had a lot of involvement with us on this film. Yeah. I remember him coming by and taking a look at some of our very first water simulation yeah, tests. Right. Some of the first decent looking water coming back and just kind of, wow, this is pretty amazing stuff. And it was just so energizing getting that from him because then he could start to see what the film was going to do from that yeah. side as well. One of the other things that I find very impressive is the level of acting and animation in the film. Because one of the things Andrew was adamant about from day one I is... I adamant a lot in these things. Do I? Well, you were. <laughs> I was. I was. I was. <laughs> and it's a, it was yeah. good. It, it was, was just job. that he didn't want overly anthropomorphized fish. Yes, they had to act. Yes, they had to express things. I mean, there is a story to tell. Yeah, could you use the grammar of natural fish, fish motor movements. And yeah. that's a very limiting thing uh, with these fish. I mean, it's a face on a, 
body. Yeah. I mean, how do you, how do you, this is all you got, right? Keep but it was a big challenge for the animators, but they also then had to deal with the idea of gravity and density, which they did superbly while acting. You love when the animators would go, oh, there's basically two types of swimming. There's rowers and there's flappers. Right, right. Just to suddenly find those keys. Those just, little keys. They just help you so much. The amount of, like, firsts that came with this yeah. film. I mean, not only from what made it on the screen, but what had to go behind the scenes to make mm -hmm. all that was, I mean, we completely reorganized the pipeline of how we made a movie for, for Nemo. I remember getting in discussions with people saying, well, no, that's not how you make a computer animation. It's like, okay, there's only ever been five of these things, <laughs> and we did them all, so <laughs> if there are some rules, we can break them. Exactly. <laughs> for me personally, working on it and then seeing it come to life in the computer with all the artistry, it's almost as if I didn't work on it, because it's like this whole other thing better than you could possibly right. imagine. And then, of course, to see it come out and be such a success was just a... Uh, Phenomenal. Yeah, I know. I know. I'll never work on anything that will be as long-lasting and in the zeitgeist as, as as Nemo was. I mean, it's it it's kind of crazy. It was like double what we would have even let, let ourselves imagine it could be like. Well, you would never enjoy it. I remember. Oh, I, that's I, I had. That's, I had There's so a much reason that father's like he is in the movie, Marlon. I had so much confidence in the movie by the end. I did not. And you would not accept. I'm so superstitious. I know, but you would not allow yourself to think that we had something good on our hands. <laughs> I mean, it was like pathological. Well, all my three kids were born after the film, so they've come to the movie now. It's a thing that's part of the culture in the playground and discussed at kindergarten and describing the characters and speaking whale is stuff that they just do. I don't know, something about the fish and stuff, it just, people use it as terminology. When you go to any aquarium and you walk up to a clownfish, someone will yell, Nemo, and I've never been on a beach where someone hadn't said, mine, mine, mine. That you're one's stuck. You're sitting at your desk doing this and then somehow it's out on a beach. Internationally, here. it's in the lexicon of aquarium viewers now. Well, when I'm in an aquarium now, you know, the kids will be saying, hey, there's a Nemo, and there'll be like a manta ray flying around. I'll go, hey, it's a Mr. Ray over here. You know, just... I thought we were going to hear some Mr. Ray right now. Oh, now nah, later, OK. <laughs> I'm still getting emails with sushi and Nemo. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> Remember that first game? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it was funny the first 7,000 yeah. times. Wasn't there, like, when we were doing press before the movie came out, the number one question we were always asked is if we were going to have sushi at the wrap party. Yeah. Yes. Yeah? That's right. Which we did. For me, looking back at the film now, watching it with my kids, I see the film, but I also see all the people and the work that went into the film when yeah. I watch it. So yeah. it's as if for, you know, almost two hours, you're watching a yearbook cool. playback. That's yeah. right. The most interesting screen of a film was the one where the whole company would come and, and they just applaud at the, the strangest time. Like, yeah. Yeah. Right. Here's a shot. Yeah. Oh, look, there's 10,000 jellyfish. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> Because they know how hard that was. <laughs> if you still got something in your cups, I'd say cheers to 10 years, and let's hope oh it's, we're still talking about it 10 years from now. It's been a pleasure and an honor. You're adamant about that. I'm adamant about it. <laughs>